if nothing else. I hope you can truly see how this is a violation of our privacy and how some of us have felt uncomfortable, awkward, um, embarrassed, and even traumatized by this experience. That's the voice of Riley Gaines, a courageous U.S. Olympic swimmer who testified to Virginia legislators about the harm caused to women's sports when biological males join female teams. What can you do to protect fairness in sports in our state? Welcome to Speak Up Virginia, equipping you to speak up on the life, family, and freedom issues that matter most to you. From the Family Foundation, I'm your host, Candy Cushman, with our president, Victoria Cobb. Well, we have some really important bills to talk about, like the fairness in female sports and other parental rights legislation. But before we get into that, I really do want to hear your recap on the March for Life. Oh, yeah. We just had a fantastic March for Life. It was our fifth annual March for Life. It was the first one since we've been able to celebrate a post-Row environment. And um, the most exciting part, I think, is not just that people turned out, but just that we have such strong support from our statewide offices that our governor was part of the march. I mean, he came and he was right in front of the banner and he was interviewing with the media right there. And our attorney general even came and gave just a beautiful talk. So I think people enjoyed it and felt like it made a difference. It really was just such an energetic crowd. I, I think everyone just felt so much hope in this significant moment that we're post row, but now it's up to the state. So there really was tremendous energy. There was at least, we think, 5,000 people there. I mean, it was amazing to see them all coming out and surging around the governor when he came out to, to join the march. Let's just hear um, a little bit of what he said in that moment. Virginians coming together in an extraordinary way to stand up for life. Yeah! And, uh, and this is a great statement by a lot of people, young people, older people, folks from all walks of life, to demonstrate the fact that we stand to protect life. And I'm just so encouraged by it. So thank you, everybody. Now, you can hear him saying that it really sends a clear message when that big turnout is there. Why do you think that's significant? I just think they want to minimize the fact that there are so many people standing for life in the media and in those committees. They want to act like we're a small minority, but we're not. And in fact, I think on some of the bills that were presented, there are 60 percent support bills. Mm -hmm. And that's when you pull across Virginia. And that makes a difference. So sometimes they just have to see the people to connect it with things mm -hmm. like polling and, and what they hear. Yeah. And I literally stood at the end of the march and just watched these floods of people. And it was faces of all different ages and colors, um, Hispanic, black, Asian, these adorable families with little kids and wagons they were carting. I mean, it was truly amazing. Oh, I think I think when people see it, the youth element youth, is yeah. really significant. You, it's more so than any other rally that I see when we see things at the Capitol. And I think all these students that come from the different schools, I think that makes a huge difference. And to your point, all these families are just absolutely adorable. And when you watch the news coverage, these women telling their stories, you know, they they walk up with a mic and somebody's mm -hmm. saying, well, I'm here because I, I'm post-abortive or I'm mm -hmm. here because I gave up my child for adoption. They're really powerful stories. Yeah. Well, one of the things that touched my heart the most was what the Attorney General, Jason Meir, has shared during the rally right before we all marched around the Capitol. And um, I had never heard him share this before, but he was personally touched by the abortion issue when his young cousin, uh, Louisa, he said he didn't grow up with sisters, so his cousins were kind of like his sisters. And so uh, years ago, his cousin called him up. She was just a year out of high school. Um, was facing an unplanned pregnancy. Her boyfriend had said that, that he didn't want the baby. She didn't know what to do. So the attorney general really helped her navigate that. Let's just hear a clip of that story. Her problem was so many of her friends were telling her to end the pregnancy. At the end of the day, she gave one of the most beautiful gifts, one of the bravest gifts a young woman can ever give. She gave the gift of life. And then she gave away that beautiful gift, that little boy named Nathan, to a loving family that could give that young boy a life that she couldn't. Tragically, a number of years later, Louisa got diagnosed with breast cancer. And after a very difficult struggle, she passed. I got to speak at her funeral, and I talked about her legacy. 
and her most amazing legacy was the fact that she gave away her young son Nathan to a new family to raise him. And I was able to share the bravery that she showed. After the funeral, I was at the reception, reminiscing about Louise's life, in which I got a tap on the shoulder. I turned around, there was a young man standing there, and he said, hello, I'm Nathan. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine, as he tells, that literally he ends up at his cousin's funeral and gets to meet this child that's been put up for adoption. I mean, it's the whole thing is just so powerful. And I think for so many people, this issue touches home. That's the thing. Everybody's been impacted by different pregnancies and adoptions. And um, and so I think him sharing that just just really reminds everybody that we all have a, a place in this story and that the more that we can support things like adoption, because we were yeah. out there also talking about adoption tax credits mm -hmm. and things like that. So I think it was really powerful. Well, speaking of that, um, let's just start into this week's update on the General Assembly. And you mentioned adoption, and we do have a bill that gives a tax credit to families that are adopting. Do we know where that's at? Um, yeah, it still hasn't been heard. Probably by the time this airs, it will have been heard. So we don't really know what the reaction is. We're hearing it's a very tight budget situation. And even though, you know, we know there's all this excess money, we talked about that on, on this show before, but as they're putting the budget together, we're hearing they're going to be real hesitant about tax credits. So I'm hoping that this one is maybe one of the very few that they accept. Yeah, that is definitely worth supporting. Absolutely. Um, the other one I think that's still in play as we're recording is uh, Nick Freitas' Born Alive bill. What, what's yes. the update on that? Yeah, so this is, again, just a reminder for folks, this, is, this isn't this is even, I don't even consider this an abortion issue. This is after a baby's been born out of an, a botched abortion. So um, this is just saying we're going to save that life. And so that bill has moved out of committee and it's headed to the floor by the time this airs. We expect it will have passed the floor probably painfully on partisan lines, which it shouldn't be a partisan issue. Mm-hmm. Well, there is some good news. We talked about before how we have these efforts to try to enshrine unlimited abortion in our state constitution, and it looks like that's going to be dead for this year. Right? Yes, thankfully. We have a House that did a great job just calling out why that is a terrible idea, and they defeated the bill. And so there'll be a Senate version that could come over, but it should hit that same House committee, and we would expect they would have the same action with the Senate bill. Well, taking a pivot, that's kind of a popular word in our office is pivot. <laughs> so we're going to pivot right now and talk about the fairness in female sports bill. Tell us what's going on with that. Well, first of all, when you say pivot and sports, <laughs> I'm just having bad basketball memories. <laughs> but um, side point, uh, no, this is an amazing bill. This is House Bill 1387. It's carried by Delegate Greenhall. And the concept of this bill is so basic. It just says, look, we're not going to have biological boys compete against our girls. I, I, I don't think it's anything that has to be complicated. And I think almost every parent would agree this is really, really important for their girls. And so um, it applies to both the K-12 sports situation, so um, high school in particular, but also deals with college, which we know is incredibly important. And so this bill has been a battle, we'll say. It's been a, a lot of work to try to convince legislators who are so out of touch with normal everyday moms that just want to make sure that their girls are playing in a fair arena. Yeah, so let's talk about how this works. So to protect the integrity of our girls' sports, um, it looks like the bill's trying to do this by creating three divisions in sports, one for biological males, one for biological females, and an open division. So kind of how does that help? Well, it simply allows the opportunity for girls who only want to compete against girls to have that protected space um you know it's this really plays out in individualized sports is where you really see this where all of a sudden you have a, and we brought in swimmers to testify on this and that's where you really see it where a girl is you know you could have a boy compete for a it's a specific time, right? These are timed events. It's a little bit different than basketball or other things where it's an individualized, objective measure. And we just can't have that because they're biologically not the same. And so the yeah. open says, okay, if you want to if you want to do that, you could be in this open category. Yeah. But if you don't, you don't have to. Yeah. So our girls are assured of having a level playing field to compete. Um, at the same time, with this open division, people have that choice and no one's getting banned here. Yeah, so. it means everybody can play. It just means that you don't have to lose your scholarship 
to someone yeah. that you shouldn't have to compete against. Well, one thing that really drove this home was we heard this super compelling testimony from this very courageous young woman named Riley Gaines, who revealed exactly what happens when you fail to protect the integrity of our women's sports. Yeah, her testimony could not have been more powerful. And some people don't realize it, but they've actually heard her story because she is a U.S. Olympic trial qualifier. So real deal serious swimming here. And when she went to compete in the 2022 NCAA Swimming Championships, there showed up a six foot four biological male that some people have heard of who uh, had previously competed at the University of Pennsylvania on the boys, the men's swim team mm -hmm. as Will Thomas. And this year when she goes to compete, he shows up as Leah Thomas competing in the women's swimming events. Yeah, and not mu not that much time had gone by since he was competing with the men. No, and now, that's the point. Yeah. It's, all it's of a like sudden we're just going to switch teams. Yeah. Um, and then she tied – she and he still got to hold the trophy. Down to the 100th of a second. I mean, ties, you know, the <laughs> 100th of a second, they tie. They both get fifth place, and there's one trophy. And they basically tell her, oh, by the way, he's going to get the trophy. And sh she, thankfully, doesn't stand for that. She actually contends for that. Yeah. And they say, well, at least for the pictures, Leah has to hold it because they wanted to make That's this the big biological deal. Male. The biological male. They wanted to make a big deal that he was in the sport. And so she was uh, deplatformed, I would say, in a way that's very literal. Well, thankfully, she's been courageous enough to, to speak up about it, even though she gets a lot of flack for that. And let's just hear this clip from her testimony in the Virginia legislature. In addition to being forced to give up our awards, our titles, and our opportunities, the NCAA forced female swimmers to share a locker room with Thomas a 6'4", 22-year-old male who was fully intact with male genitalia. Let me be clear. We were not forewarned. We were not asked for our consent, and we did not give our consent. If nothing else, I hope you can truly see how this is a violation of our privacy and how some of us have felt uncomfortable, awkward, um, embarrassed, and even traumatized by this experience. I know I don't speak for everyone. I, it's impossible to speak for everyone. But I can attest to the tears that were shed on that pool deck by these poor ninth and 17th place finishers who missed out on being named an All-American by one place. And I can attest to the extreme discomfort in the locker room when you turn around and there is a male watching you undress while exposing himself. I can attest to the anger and frustration from these girls who had worked so hard and sacrificed so much to get to this point. Okay, well, I hope that emotional testimony with her just, you know, breaking down like that is a wake-up call to at least some people. This was a committee hearing, right? Was this committee hearing? Yeah. So I hope some people in there, that was a wake-up call for them. Um, but actually, there were some people trying to, to dismiss this reality right there in front of them. Oh, yeah. Look at Eileen Fillercorn, who used to be our House Speaker when the Democrats were in control. She goes and gives this speech, and honestly, it felt like a campaign speech. I mean, it was this big... Uh, aggressive speech against this bill, but she literally says that the bill is a solution in search of a problem, as if no one's impacted by this after after she's heard the testimony of Riley yeah. Gaines. Riley's like, right there. I, I'm right there. Hello, this is me. I'm telling you that I've had this problem, and, and it was at the U.S. Olympic trial level that we had this problem. Yeah. And then you had these comments to top it all off from Delegate Jeff Bourne, right, from Richmond? Yeah, he could not have been, uh, you know, there's a decorum thing that's supposed to happen in our, in our committees. They're supposed to not name call. They're supposed to be respectful of people that testify on both sides. And he literally went on to basically say that people are transphobic if they disagree with men playing in women's sports. And then he called people small-minded that supported this bill. And hateful, I think, was a word he yeah, used. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I and to the point where Delegate Freitas, who was running the committee, basically had to give a warning. Like, look, we're not going to keep calling people names on this committee. And you said you saw something where Riley actually spoke uh, up about talking to Delegate Bourne afterwards. Yeah, she did a phenomenal job. Apparently, she approached him afterwards and she said she just challenged him. She said, you know, you called everybody transphobic that, you know, the hateful that doesn't agree with you on this position about the bill. And she said, but then you went on to say that kids don't complain about boys playing in girls sports like the kids don't care. So why are you all making a big deal as if it's like a political point trying to be mm -hmm. scored here? And and he said, well, yeah, yeah. And she. And she basically said, well, do you think it's because you call people hateful and transphobic that they can't say anything? Which I thought was so awesome. Yes. I mean, and she did it respectfully, but yeah. 
She made the point. Good for her. Yeah. All right. Well, there's one thing that even these left wing delegates cannot deny or act like is not reality. And that is actual biological facts. I mean, I guess they can deny if they want to, but they can't erase these biological facts. And that's the fact that men do have higher cardiovascular capacity, greater bone density, more muscle mass. And so what does that mean? That means that they're pretty much always going to be faster, stronger, and bigger in these competitions yeah. against women. We're not going to see this problem where biological women are going to go and beat the men out in their sport. That's just not how this is going to happen. So ultimately, and we had a representative in who carried this bill in Idaho, and she came and spoke, and she said, if you believe this, if you're okay with this, you have to be okay with 12 biological men coming out and trying out for your basketball team and having an entirely male team that for what's supposed to be women's basketball because that's the reality. And if you're saying it's how they feel and what they get to do, that can be okay. And she said it changes the nature of the entire sport because other people will then go recruit biological men to play against that one team that has biological men. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and this is a personal issue for you, too, because you're raising girls that love sports. Yeah, we're a big sports family. I played sports. I can't imagine if I had to play basketball in particular just because of the height differences. I can't imagine if I had to play basketball against men, um, although it would have been entertaining to see them in field hockey. <laughs> but side point, um, yeah, I have girls that play volleyball and swim and do all sorts of things. And, yeah, I want them to be able to compete. And, I mean, yeah, if they deserve a scholarship or they deserve a trophy, I want them to earn that and get that feeling of confidence from what comes when you when you compete in sports. All right. Well, I'm just going to take a moment to share if this is something that you are concerned about and we, you know, other issues that we're talking about and you think people need to know about this. Um, I would encourage you to make a point to share our podcast with your friends, fellow church members as a way to help them stay up on what's really happening that they're not hearing in the news. And an easy way to do that is just to let them know they can subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Google Play, what, whatever their favorite platform is. Um, but also when you listen and if you like what you hear and you give us a five star review, that also helps elevate the podcast so that other people can find it. Um, so those are two things you can do that help get the word out on these very important issues. So thanks for listening. Well, back to the topic here. Um, you know, the good news is there is a lot of momentum on this issue around the nation. I read somewhere that at least 18 states have passed fairness and female sports types laws. Yeah, it's it's actually very much moving forward around the country. And we would like to see this become law in Virginia. And so where we are now, we've passed the bill has been recommended out of the subcommittee, barely. I just need to tell people how tight this is. Uh, you know, people think, oh, the House is Republican, and of course Republicans on board. And you know, when the issue polls at 70% across Virginia, you'd think it's actually bipartisan. Mm -hmm. But it came out of the subcommittee because one person didn't vote, even though she wanted to vote against it. So we got somebody to n sort of just take a walk, not vote, in order to get that out of subcommittee. We believe that's how it's going to go in committee, that, again, the same person is willing to just not vote. But somehow we have to get this through the House of Delegates. So by the time this airs, we'll see what will have happened. But I, I, I will tell you, things move fast around here, and we're just praying that the bill is charting its way quickly over to the Senate. Okay. Thank you for that update. Well, do we want to real quick give our audience an update on any other parental rights bills that are going on right now? Well, certainly Sage's Law we've talked about here, a big parental rights just saying, look, if your child believes or is acting as another gender in a school setting, they need to, your parents need the parents need to know. And so that is a big bill and it is very dicey getting even through the house. Again, mm -hmm. there are legislators that hear loud voices from a small minority in the LGBT crowd, and they really believe that they have to cater to this group of people. And so it's got tough. It's got a tough track through the House. And then again, of course, when we get to the Senate side, it's going to be incredibly difficult. It really does show you kind of the um, power, unfortunately, of the corporate media, because even though you have these polls with what the public needs, you still have legislators, even on the um, Republican side, that are feeling this almost peer pressure, so to speak. Um, so we really need your prayers on that very important law. But the good news is there's some others that looks like they are going to head over to the Senate. Um, there is one from Tim Anderson that would categorize library books and kind of notate the ones that have graphic material and give parents a, a chance to say they don't want their kids checking those out. 
Um, there's a, there's another library bill. I think it's uh, Oreg. Uh, yeah, Delegate Oreg Dele- has one. Yeah. Yep. That would uh, call on schools to have policies regarding the library explicit material issue. Um, and then Delegate Freitas yes. has one. And that's, you know, basically saying if somebody's going to come in and speak to your school or be part of a parent should know. These things seem logical. Yeah. So those are all things you want to pay attention mm-hmm. to. Watch for our emails, uh, email alerts and make sure you support those and get in touch with your representative. Let them know you want to see those things pass representatives and senators, really, because it's going to go over to the Senate. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. OK. OK. We just got this news in. It turns out that Sage's Law passed the committee. So we, we squeak through. That's what I was worried about was, you know, how tight it was going to be 11 to 10. It's a 22 person committee. So as I mentioned, someone literally took a walk so that this thing could at least get to the floor. So appreciate that. Can't figure out why you can't vote for it. But at least we're getting there. So onto the House. So when we're as we're taping this, it goes to the House. Yep. Um, you know, by the time you hear this, we don't know where it'll be at. But again, just be praying over this issue. Well, it's that time again. Time for our Inconceivable Moments Award. This is where we're featuring examples of the absolute lunacy and craziness that happens when cultural leaders try to give guidance completely apart from biblical principles. And we're calling this the Liberals' Most Inconceivable Moments Award. Inconceivable! All right, I'm going to cheat a little bit for this week's Inconceivable because I'm going to give updates on past Inconceivables. Um, And first, you all might remember that we talked about the very brave Philadelphia Flyers hockey player that bucked the trend and just respectfully decided to stay in the locker room rather than going out and adorning these Pride Night rainbow uh, colors for the practice. Um, You know, but I had heard analysts commenting that maybe the amount of flack and attack that he got publicly in the media over this might actually create an intimidation factor for other players and make it where they would just feel forced to comply. Well, I'm happy to say that it looks like actually maybe there was a redemptive impact out of his courage. Yeah, it's kind of crazy how it all turned out. You know, people are now expressing shock and dismay because, as it turned out, after advertising, their team was going to come out and wear all these LGBT, uh, you know, adorned jerseys and so forth. Basically, they were going to, you know, remember, rainbow-wrapped hockey Hockey sticks. sticks. But after all this, the New York Rangers did an about face, and they decided actually to have their team come out and wear Liberty Head jerseys instead. So basically, um, to explain this decision, they released a statement that said, quote, we support everyone's individual rights to respectfully express their beliefs. So, yeah, they had a longer statement. That was just one part of it that we're shortening down here. But yeah. But that's a good thing. Yeah. It's really interesting because no one actually knows exactly why the team made this decision. We don't know if there were players that weren't going to wear the rainbow colors or whether they were just trying to be get out in front of what could be a public relations mess. Um, But the good news is it it appears that Ivan's, Ivan Provorov, uh, was the player that was courageous on the Philadelphia Flyers, um, that his courage is at least making these teams think twice before they just force all these players to physically put something on their bodies that communicates a controversial political message. Yeah, I mean, the team still celebrated the Pride Night or whatever, but they didn't have to do it with each person having to own the message themselves. And I think that is important. Yeah. All right. Well, I do want to throw out one more little trivial, inconceivable update. You guys might remember that we talked about the female M&Ms and how there had been some controversy around them. Yes, there are female and male M&Ms in the little cartoon characters that kind of we see on television um well the female characters had some changes in their footwear in particular the green female m M&M lost her go-go boots and you know and instead is wearing some cool looking sneakers uh, maybe that's more politically acceptable in today's culture i'm not really sure well i i do have a, a kind of a sad update on our on our m ms apparently these female m ms were too politically controversial because it appears and I hate to say this, it looks like they've been fired or, or at least furloughed. <laughs> They're done for now. Yeah. Th- the news came out recently. The M&M company put out a statement. And I'm looking at this colorful statement here. You can see the little M&Ms, M&Ms at the bottom showing dismay or kind of waving or something. <laughs> They're saying, here, here, I'm going to read, America, let's talk. In the last year, we've made some changes to our beloved spokes candies. We weren't sure anyone would even notice, and then it goes on to say, but now we get it. Even a candy's shoes can be polarizing. So, Victoria, did you know there was such a thing as a spokes candy? (laughs) 
know. I I I don't even know what to I don't even know what to say. And I'm sad that shoes could be such a big deal. Yeah, everything's polarizing in this culture. <laughs> It makes me worried about what kind of shoes you wear when you're out giving. You know, I do spokes talks for lots of things. You know, we, we, yeah, I, now I'm going to be all conscious of what I'm wearing. All right, people, we got the M&M candies fired. Now, I assume this was equal firing and the male spokes candies were fired too. Yeah, it's a good question people. because then they have a discrimination claim that they were fired because they were female. I think that's, wow. Um, and then there's a question of, are they in a state with an ERA? Okay, I shouldn't go there. But, you know, you know, we could, the world is supposedly not able to work if you don't have an Equal Rights Amendment. That's not actually true. But All right, I saw where they've been replaced by an actual human being, like that this person is going to be What a new, concept yeah. to actually have a person, not an but, inanimate object. I mean, come on, those little cute M&M characters on television, I like them. I'm going to miss them. I, I do hope they return. So we're not getting like a Super Bowl commercial I mean, with the M&Ms? I, I, kinda, and... I, don't, I don't think so. I, I hope don't... they didn't already pay like a gazillion dollars for a commercial spokes... and then decide they had to. This you, The new human being person is going to do the Super Bowl okay, commercial. All right, well. uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure the word Super Bowl is copyrighted and you guys have to use the word big game. What? So... I can't do that. We get a live person for M and M's for the big game, yeah. Instead of well, I hope they didn't buy a big cartoon. commercial for the big game and have to change to a big person instead of a spokes candy. All right, are <laughs> none of y'all gonna make the obvious joke that I could be the real spokes candy? <laughs> yes, candy, you go. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. You could jump in there. You could say, "Hey, we're done with candy," but here's uh, candy. I know what I'm adding to my list of ideas for Christmas gifts this year. <laughs> Hey, I like M and M's. I'll I'll take M and M's. No, 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 no. It would oh. be a costume of the M and M's. No, we're not doing that. Uh, yep, yep. What shoes? Yep. What shoes would she be wearing? The go-go boots, one hundred percent. Thanks for joining us for this week's Speak Up Virginia, brought to you by the Family Foundation. Visit us at familyfoundation.org. That's familyfoundation.org. See you next time, and don't forget, we are stronger when we speak together.